I, I think we're, we're getting there. Um, I just want to give a quick little preamble to Brad. So this is his grand rounds that he was obviously supposed to do back in March. It was the last ones that were canceled before uh, COVID hit. Um, so it's been kind of a little time in the pla uh, planning. And uh, hopefully what we can do today is use this. It's a little bit of a near and dear to our hearts about trying to get uh, hip fractures a bit more managed in the eMERGE. Uh, we've actually got some allied health uh, so geriatric, uh, some anesthesia, and some uh, surgical unit uh, hip fracture uh, attendees here today. So hopefully they can uh, chime in when they feel that there's uh, some stuff they can uh, uh, enlighten us with as well. And then we're going to leave some discussion at the end there for the staff and, and residents, obviously, to kind of ask the questions that they need, but also, you know, ask what it is that we can do to kind of help roll this out a little bit. But I'll let Brad kind of spend the next 40 minutes or so trying to convince you uh, and reducing the barriers for us using this in the eMERGE. So uh, I'll let Brad take it from here. Okay, and just can somebody give me a thumbs up if I sound okay? Awesome, thanks. Okay, so <clears throat> today we are going to be doing a talk on hip fractures in the ED. I called it Opportunity for Better Care. So um, I think uh, as I'm going to go through, you're going to see that this is, as you already know, a really big issue, something we see frequently. And so are there ways that we can improve patient care as well as kind of uh, expenditure within the healthcare system? So. The uh, TLDR version of this, if you only have two minutes to spare, um, I'm essentially going to be saying patients deserve um, really good care when they when they have hip fractures. Um, regional anesthesia is becoming more and more common for this, and uh, it's something that I hope we should be at least offering all patients. Um, maybe not all patients qualify for it, and not all patients are going to want it, but um, it's a skill that I think almost anybody can learn, and it's something that we really should be should be doing. So what is my goal for this talk? I tried to make this as obscene a slide as, as one can make um, to kind of be jarring. So it's to increase the utilization of regional anesthesia in the emergency department for patients with hip fractures. So uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, some of you will, um, the seed will be planted and you'll be um, somewhat interested in doing this. It's up to you, it's up to all of us. I think this is uh, something that we can really uh, do to benefit our patients. So jumping in, um, in terms of how big a deal is our, our hip fractures. So uh, in Canada, you can see in 1994, there were 23,000 uh, hip fractures. Um, and by 2041, the projection is there'll be 88,000 um, per year. So pretty significant to put that in a more local context of Ontario. Back in 2012, there was about 13,000 um, uh, incidents of hip fractures with a mean age of 80 and uh, average length of stay for those patients at uh, just over two weeks. So obviously a pretty significant um, uh, health issue. Uh, this equates to $37,500 per um, incident of hip fracture per year, uh, so which is pretty significant. So for Ontario, that's $282 million spent on this issue. And in Canada, um, nationally, it is 1.1 billion with a B. Um, so, and that's attributable to all healthcare costs um, related to hip fractures. So uh, quite uh, expensive um, issue that we're dealing with. Uh, if we look uh, even more locally uh, towards LHSC, um, so there's a study done by doctors Lewendi and Sanders, who are our orthopedic uh, surgeon colleagues, um, and so they looked uh, between the years 2005 and 2010 uh, at Victoria Hospital, and they saw 835 patients um, requiring surgical fixation, which uh, during that study was about 192 per year. Uh, again, mean age roughly the same as what I just mentioned, so 81. And the at that time, the mean delay from the time of admission to OR was about two days. Uh, just pulling some of the stats from last year, um, there was 556 ED visits for hip fractures. Not necessarily did all of those require um, ORs, obviously some would be palliative, et cetera. Um, and it's very hard to see, I apologize, I couldn't make this any bigger, but uh, the, if you look at the bottom right corner of the screen, the, and sorry, can you guys see my mouse? Yes, I see some nods, okay. So the blue uh, represents Victoria, the orange is UH. That red line is the 48 hour mark. Um, and so these are patients that are having their surgeries done um, at, like by an hour. So you can see most in, at Victoria are being done within that 48-hour um, uh, window with, with actually the highest number being at around one day. And then UH, um, not quite as good. Uh, it's, it's more spread out past 48 hours. And that's probably to do with there was a 
study called hip attack, which they tried to see if having uh, surgery within, I think it was 24 hours, would benefit patients. And I think that was only carried out at um, Victoria. So um, this is my anecdotal list for why people don't perform blocks. These are some of the things I've heard about in terms of, uh, you know, why this is not something that people will do. And so I hope to go through this list um, and one by one show you how it's not, maybe it's something that we actually can be doing. So the first point um, is I don't know how to do it and it's too hard to learn. So let's tackle that one. Uh, so um, just before we get into that, um, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, strongly supports regional anesthesia. Um, they feel there's strong evidence behind it and they recommend its use in, in managing patients with hip fractures. Um, so uh, how often are these performed? So this study came out of Toronto. This was a, a survey study looking at emergency physicians, uh, both staff and residents. Um, and what they saw was that 77% of residents uh, said, and sorry, this is from 2000 and, oh, I actually don't have it. Oh, it's, anyway, only a couple years ago. 77% uh, of residents had never performed this, um, this procedure and 67% of staff had never performed this procedure. And then of the ones that often or almost always do it, you can see here 0% uptake by residents and only 6%, which is only three staff, um, that uh, that did it either often or always. Interestingly, um, of the ones that did uh, blocks, they averaged at about 10 blocks or more, um, or around 10 per month. So it showed to me that once you uh, obtain the skill, it's one that can be easily performed and part of your everyday practice. Um, so I just want to touch on this. I have a friend in uh, at U Ottawa who was doing his anesthesia residency up until last year, and he did a QI project um, looking at uh, doing regional anesthesia for hip blocks. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, and I just wanted to touch on it. So um, in 2016, they did an audit where they looked to see how many patients coming through the emergency department were being offered regional anesthesia, and they found only 17% of patients during that time were. Um, so they did an intervention. So intervention number one was they trained ED physicians on live subjects or a low fidelity simulation model, which was chicken breast. Um, and I will talk about how they did that. But I think before we uh, get into this, I think it's important to just go over a little bit of anatomy so we understand how this block works. So um, ho hopefully somebody understands this reference. It's not, I'm not too old. Um, but this block that we're going to be talking about is called, uh, it's described as being the pop pop block and it's based on the two fascial planes that you're going to be popping through. So um, if we think this person, uh, if this is uh, like you would be in a CT scan, this is somebody's right leg. So screen left is lateral and screen right is medial. Um, you have uh, several structures of uh, importance uh, for this procedure. So the first is, um, well, to go back, you have your three structures, your nerve, artery, and vein going from lateral to medial. You have above the iliopsoas muscle, uh, this white line here, which is your fascia iliaca. Uh, this muscle over here, the only reason why I show this now is because when I show you the ultrasound demonstration, you'll see two muscle bellies. And um, uh, just so, you, so yeah, that's the sartorius and then the iliopsoas beside it. And then above, you have this other white line here, which is the fascia lata. So your needle is going to be coming from uh, screen left, so lateral. Uh, this uh, doesn't need to be done. I, you see an ultrasound probe there, but this actually doesn't need to be done with an ultrasound. Um, so again, fascia iliaca, fascia lata. Here is our needle. And as we advance through the first fascia lata, you get that pop. And then if you keep advancing, you hit the second fascia iliaca and you pop. And that is where you're going to be uh, injecting a large amount of um, local anesthetic to, to bathe both the femoral nerve and a couple of the nerves, which I'll talk about. Um, the good thing about this block is you can see our needle is, and in reality, it's even further away, but um, uh, it's not anywhere near that nerve. Um, and so the likelihood of any trauma to either the nerve or the artery or uh, vein is, is quite low. So getting back to chicken. Um, so you essentially take a chicken breast, uh, you cut it into three and you, in between each layer of chicken, you lie a, um, a glove on top. And so you get this 
kind of three, three chicken breasts, three gloves, and the top glove represents your skin, the second glove represents your fascia lata, and the, the next glove represents your fascia iliaca. And this does pretty well represent the sensation you get when you're poking through those um, fascia layers. So if it's, if you're wondering if it's something you would feel, that you can at least, if you're not gonna do this, you can at least think about what that might feel like when you poke the needle through the glove. Um, so after doing this uh, intervention, they checked a year later and, and had seen that uptake was around 54%, which is a pretty significant improvement. Um, they then realized that there was a number of, uh, this doesn't apply so much, but there was a number of patients uh, that were direct to orthopedics that were being missed. So when they added a second intervention uh, in which they targeted orthopedic residents to do this block, and did an audit uh, the following year, they found uptake had gone all the way up to 75% up from 17. So pretty, si pretty significant uh, increase. So <clears throat> their flow chart was a patient's either diagnosed in the emergency department or as direct orthopedics. The, they, you ask, is this patient medically appropriate for a regional anesthetic? And if they are either the um, emergency physician, the anesthesia resident or the orthopedic resident uh, perform the block uh, and then eventually get transferred. Um, so I don't know, this still seems too hard, sure. Uh, so um, how are people doing this around the world? So uh, looking at studies coming from Europe, uh, this is a pre-hospital study. The one thing to realize in Europe, a lot of times their pre-hospital system um, is staffed with uh, EMS, but also nursing is often involved. So this study looked at pre-hospital nursing staff and um, doing fascia iliaca blocks, which is the one I showed you uh, before, in the field when there's a presumed um, hip fracture. They presumed there to be a hip fracture if there was significant pain, if there was difficulty with uh, flexion, if the, if the leg was externally rotated, um, and if the pain was uh, rated to be four or higher. I will go over the landmarking for this uh, in a minute, but um, essentially they uh, palpated between the uh, ASIS, um, which is point number one, and the symphysis pubis. You go to the lateral third uh, of that line, you drop down a centimeter, and that's where you pop your needle in. Um, so they would inject lidocaine for the study, and you can see on the uh, screen right the pain scores. The median score initially was eight, and by the time the patient arrived to hospital, it was uh, three. Um, the uh, primary outcome was pain score to drop by two points, and uh, for that outcome, they had a 96% um, success rate with no complications noted. Um, so how do you perform this block? So you, you don't actually need to draw the line, um, but this is just for demonstration. So the first thing you have to get equipment. So a 50 cc syringe, which you can find in the resuscitation bay or two 20 cc syringes, because uh, this is a, a, heart, uh, sorry, a large volume block um, where you inject a lot of uh, local anesthetic with um, saline to try to bathe multiple areas of the nerves. Uh, the second thing you need is your local anesthetic, which I'll talk about in a little bit. You need a needle, whether that's a spinal needle, a just a regular 25 gauge, one and a half inch needle, um, an 18, you can pretty much use any needle you want, um, and then just a, a lollipop just to clean the skin. You then identify landmarks. So in this case, like I said previously, you, you palpate for the ASIS. Um, this is if you're going to be doing it blind. So you palpate the ASIS and the symphysis pubis. You imagine a line between those two structures and you go to the lateral one third, um, which is right, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's right there. You drop down a centimeter and that is where you're going to be injecting. And you can see that this, uh, for some reason this picture is a bit compressed, but even there you can see you're pretty far away from any, <coughs> sorry, any major structure. Um, so at this point you've cleaned the skin, you uh, insert your needle perpendicular to the skin, you feel those two pops that I mentioned, which is your fascia lata and iliaca, and then you uh, inject. If for some reason you're experiencing a lot of resistance, that would um, suggest you're too deep into the, uh, into the um, muscle, and you would just withdraw a little bit and try again. Um, so, so staying with this theme of the pre-hospital staff performing this block, so the question is how safe is this? This study, uh, look, it was seven studies compiled together. They looked at uh, about 700 patients of which 245 receives um, fascia iliaca block. And they only noted one uh, adverse event, which was described as uh, transient tachycardia and uh, elevated blood pressure, which uh, resolved on its own. Um, 
their success rate in terms of pain management was about 90%. And again, just that one adverse event out of around 250 patients. So to me, the fact that uh, pre-hospital, um, our pre-hospital colleagues are doing this suggests that it's a block that is um, something that essentially almost anybody can do if you just get a tiny bit of training on how to do it. Um, and it's certainly something that as emerge physicians, uh, it's a skill that we should be able to learn pretty easily. Uh, in terms of physician specific now, so <clears throat> can ED physicians learn to perform fascia iliac blocks? Um, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so looking at a one day course run by anesthesia residents in which um, the physicians were trained on performing five blocks, um, they followed these patients out for three years and found this was um, pain scores from uh, time zero to two hours. You can see again, another uh, significant drop in terms of your uh, mean pain score, but they, they found the doctors were able to learn this and, um, and use it longitudinally over a period of time, um, suggesting that once you learn it, it's not something that you need uh, like to be refreshed on. It's, it's something that's pretty easy. And certainly there's enough of these patients coming in that it's a skill set that if it's something you want to do, you can, you can keep it up. Um, so yes, a brief training episode yielded long-term results is the take-home point there. <clears throat> so uh, number two, and this is maybe the largest point um, that I, I hear about in terms of why people would not want to do it. So it's don't mess with my flow. Uh, the ED is super busy. It takes a long time to do this. Um, there's a thousand patients in the waiting room uh, and other services can take on these patients. So it's not something I want to do. So um, this is a laceration. Uh, this will heal on its own uh, by secondary intention. Um, if you go to get your lidocaine and your suture kit, uh, that will take you away from seeing other more deserving patients. We should just uh, be washing this out and sending them home, um, said, said no one ever. So I just find this interesting that this is something that um, we see this, we think this person needs stitches that needs to be washed out and, and then sent on their way and we have no issues grabbing the, the um, suture tray and doing this. Um, and I think that's because this has for a long time been part of our practice, whereas the concept of regional anesthesia for hip locks is relatively uh, new. And so, uh, but I think you could easily make the argument that patients with hip fractures are going to benefit much more substantially from us performing uh, the, this procedure than this patient will with stitches. So I just want you to keep that in mind <clears throat> when you say, you know, it's not something that we can do and that uh, it's a procedure that takes a long time because you know, depending on the size of somebody's forearm lack and you're doing, you know, 20 interrupted sutures, it can take a little bit of time too. Um, and then how sterile do we need to be? As we know, anytime we start adding in uh, um, the requirement of being sterile for procedures, that's another level of uh, time that's added on. So uh, this is, you know, the question is, what truly how sterile do we need to be to perform this? So the New York School of Regional Anesthesia in Mysore, many of you I'm sure have heard about, sort of has suggestions in terms of the degree that you should uh, you should be sterile for particular procedures. And as you move uh, from left to right on this chart, you get more invasive. So we're talking about a single shot nerve block. Um, then there's catheter uh, nerve blocks, there's um, neuroaxial blocks like uh, epidurals and spinals, and then long-term uh, device implants. So obviously as you move towards the right, uh, you're gonna be needing to be much more sterile. Their recommendation here is that you use a, um, sterile drape, uh, some chlorhexidine on the skin, and sterile gloves. Um, but when we, when we go into the real world, um, what are people actually doing? It's, there's not a lot of information out there, but it can kind of help guide us to see um, where, where do we really need to be for this. So uh, in terms of a, a survey done by anesthesiologists in the UK, um, this, this, uh, for performing uh, peripheral nerve uh, blockade prior to an OR, they ask, uh, they ask these physicians to um, kind of lay out what practices they do and do not do. So interestingly, only 13% used a sterile drape. 62% um, did not use sterile ultrasound gel. Uh, probe sterility was maintained by a full cover um, in only 23% of cases. A tagoderm in the vast majority. Um, no cover at all in 5%. Um, so certainly for certain peripheral nerve blocks, uh, it is not, um, at least according to this study, and there was a couple others that I've seen, um, people were not 100% uh, sterile like they would be if they were doing, let's say, a, a, an epidural or something. Um, 
And if you think about a lot of the blocks that we do, whether it's a ring block or an ulnar block, or we do them in a clean manner. I would, I would say we probably do not do these in full sterile manner. So if you were going to do, I don't know why the addition of an ultrasound would necessitate, necessitate bringing in a complete sterile uh, setup for that. Um, and just again, to kind of go down this path, this study, essentially they were just looking to see if using Tigoderm was safe. Um, there's this Spalding classification system, which you, this is a, it's not even a nice to know, let alone a need to know, but essentially there's, um, there's a classification for uh, healthcare equipment and uh, what degree um, of sterility should be required. And an ultrasound probe is viewed as a semi-critical uh, device requiring high level disinfection, which goes beyond a uh, simple cavi wipe. And so this study was looking at, well, if we just used cavi wipes and in between uses and then put a tagoderm on the uh, probe, would there be any issues? And they looked at um, like thousands of cases, uh, 7,500 cases and didn't see any evidence of uh, infectious complications from this technique. So if you're going to do this technique by ultrasound, it's nice to know that you have a lot of uh, data supporting uh, not needing to you know, get up in a hazmat suit and do a full uh, cover of the probe. Uh, I will bring in one case. This is the only one I was able to find in terms of serious um, uh, adverse events from doing a regional anesthetic block. This lady unfortunately passed away uh, from necrotizing fasciitis as a complication of a brachial plexus block um, of note. So um, I think she had well-controlled diabetes. This was done in the operating room under complete sterile um, uh, setup. So. Um, yeah, anyway, there's not a lot of information about uh, complications from regional anesthetic in terms of uh, infectious complications, but here's one. Um, I don't know, the ultrasound machine is all the way over there, I'm here, I don't want to have to get that special spinal needle. So if this is you, um, sorry, if, if that is your uh, approach, and I think that's totally fine, it, it is annoying to get the needle and you know, get the, the probe and all that stuff, then I would highly recommend just doing a fascia iliaca block. You can literally do it with uh, a single syringe, a 25 gauge needle, you fill it up with local and, um, and saline. You could probably clean it with an alcohol swab. You landmark, you poke it in. You could do this procedure in honestly a minute or less, um, and it will provide significant pain relief um, uh, to patients as well as other benefits that I'll touch on um, momentarily. So. If you don't want to do it by ultrasound, which is the evidence shows is slightly better than the landmark technique, then then just just do landmark uh, approach and, and you'll still give a lot of benefit to your patients. Um, okay, point number three, which I often hear about, I don't see the benefit of doing this all this stuff for two hours of pain relief. Um, so let's talk about that. So uh, I will preface this study is probably the extreme. Uh, in terms of the benefit of regional anesthetic, I haven't seen this replicated anywhere else, but just to show that you can get quite a large degree of pain relief for a long period of time. So this was a Romanian study looking at about 39 patients um, that had uh, hip fractures. They did fascia iliaca blocks and found the mean time of um, analgesia was uh, 48 hours, which is quite long, um, but they were able, in this particular study, to get up to 48 hours of pain relief. Um, according to a Cochrane review that I read, the, the mean time is about 16 hours. And if you add dexamethasone, uh, so if you get a vial of dex and you add four milligrams, um, which is a, a one cc into your, sorry, local anesthetic, you can extend that by another six hours or so. So that takes you up to 24 hours, which at Vic at least, would cover their entire preoperative period for um, pain relief. So I know we've, I know I've talked to Jason Lamb. He, uh, he hasn't seen it out this long. A couple of the patients that I followed, certainly over the, I checked in on them on the floor up to 12 hours I had seen, I was still getting good relief. So I wasn't, I haven't followed anybody up to 24 hours yet, but uh, you can get pretty substantial period of time of pain relief. Um, I think this is something that we need to touch on. Uh, so delirium is a, uh, it's the most frequent medical complication observed in about 350,000, um, this is America uh, data, hospitalized patients with hip fractures annually. So it's a really big problem. Um, the prevalence of delirium following a hip fracture is anywhere from 13 to 61%, depending on what you read. Um, and obviously we know when people develop delirium, there's uh, negative consequences as a result of that. Um, with respect to pain, so patients experiencing severe pain
pain have a nine times increased likelihood of developing delirium. So, and if you think about the types of patients that are experiencing hip fractures, they're ripe for, uh, for experiencing delirium. They often have comorbidities, they're older, um, they're unable to um, let people know about the degree of pain that they're having. So I think uh, this, again, is another benefit of providing regional anesthetic. Um, interestingly, so 50% of patients receive inadequate analgesia and um, of those with advanced dementia or uh, receive one third the amount of morphine as cognitively intact patients. So um, just like my talk on uh, sickle cell, it's the same, same concept. So I feel like we could be a little bit more aggressive in terms of pain management. And you can see that people are often reluctant to give the, the elderly the amount of uh, opioids that are needed to manage this pain, um, even though the pain control is uh, crucial. Um, so one way to get around that, one way obviously is to you know, improve the degree of which we're prescribing pain medication, but the other would be to provide this uh, non-opioid regional anesthetic, which is gonna provide them with long-term pain relief. Uh, I don't wanna go into this in any detail. This is just a Kaplan-Meier curve looking at uh, delirium in hospitalized patients. Um, you can see that if the bottom line, the maroon color, is those who develop full de uh, syndromal delirium, and the top line is if they don't develop delirium, and you can see that mortality uh, or survival is, is worse than those that um, develop delirium. And the biggest difference you can see is right at, at the beginning, so within the first month. Um, that's where the curves separate uh, most quickly. Um, so that's where we really have a chance to, to make great headway into um, improving this and, and that can be done with a regional anesthetic. Um, so then the question is, does regional anesthesia actually decrease delirium in hip fractures? There's not a lot of great uh, studies out there. Um, I'll just touch on one, one that I came across. Um, so this was a, a study to assess the effectiveness of the fascia iliaca block for the prevention of delirium. And there were two arms. There was um, those that received a block and those that didn't uh, in terms of the rate of delirium, they found the placebo group was at 24% versus 11%. The duration of delirium was longer in the, in the group that didn't receive block, and the severity score of uh, delirium was higher in those that didn't receive regional anesthesia. Um, and there's a bunch of studies that, that echo this. Um, again, not the most robust, but um, it, it does make sense that if we're uh, adequately treating pain, um, we should be able to prevent uh, delirium. Uh, and just a, another study, so there was a, uh, in this one, they implemented a plan of doing fascia iliaca blocks, and then they retrospectively looked back prior to their implementation for, sorry, for a couple months, and then afterwards, and found that uh, mortality was higher uh, before they were doing uh, fascia iliaca, as well as length of stay was, was higher. Those were secondary outcomes, but again, there's pr uh, probably a bit of a signal there. Um, and then this I find interesting. So this is the degree to which patients can do hip flexion pre and post block by one hour. And the red line is the, the median that they found. So it went from about 15 degrees of flexion up to 60 degrees. And the importance there is, um, this is not so much for uh, pain management, but it, it allows the patient to be more engaged in their daily care, sit up, um, eat, probably less likely to have things like aspiration events, um, they're able to be moved, less likely to develop sores. So um, there's a lot of secondary benefits to being able to control the pain and have the patient be able to move. Um, okay, and then the fourth point, I'm not comfortable giving that much local anesthetic. Totally fair point. Um, we're dealing with anesthetics that uh, many of you have not used before, um, which would be ropivacaine and bupivacaine. Um, so is there a, hmm, is there a second year or actually, Rob. Rob, are you there? R3, Rob. Yeah, I'm there. Okay, okay I'm gonna put you on the spot, Rob. What is the difference between lidocaine and tetracaine? I'm not sure. Okay, Does any, do any of your R3 colleagues want to venture a guess? Taylor. I'm not sure, Brad. Okay, all right. Um, how about, um, who's here from the fours? Nobody, okay. And I will just, uh, hold on. Is there a four? Mm, DK1, no. Okay, I will just, oh, Dave Morton's here. Dave. Sorry? 
you say hey, my yes very good so uh the um this is a this is really not that important to know but uh there the two differences you have um, amides and esters, this is the uh, link between uh, two other components of your uh, molecular structure. So um, the pivocaine, ropivacaine, lidocaine, anything that has two eyes in it um, is an amide. And anything that has uh, one eye, like uh, tetracaine or cocaine, is an ester. Why that's important is if you're ever doing a procedure where somebody uh, says that they're allergic to tetracaine, then you could use lidocaine and be comfortable because you know it's a completely different molecular structure so that's just more of a, a sidetrack there but um anyway these are the two anesthetics that we're using they're amides just as a light just as lidocaine is the dosing as you can see is two and a half milligrams per kilogram with epi of epivacaine and four with epi of uh, ropivacaine it's actually not that important to know because i'm going to walk you through this app um so this is my phone so if you go to your app store, you can download Unicorn Chef Fun Cooking Games later. But for now, uh, if you type in Safe Local, you would download this program. So I obviously have it on my phone already. Um, you hit Proceed. This is a free app, by the way. Let's say we're going to do Ropivacaine with Epi. So you click that. You put the percentage. So it'll say on the bottle what it is. So it's 1%. You hit Next. You throw the weight in. So let's say they're 60 kilos. Um, let's say they're over 70 and they have severe renal dysfunction and then you can calculate your dose and it spits out what the maximum dosage is. So in this case it's 15 mils. Um, so even an older person with some uh, comorbidities can tolerate 15 mils and as you can see here the ropivacaine comes only as 10 mils. So you're, you're never really approaching anywhere close to the uh, maximum dose. Um, but typically what I do before a block is I open up safe local. I, I punch it in just make sure that I'm um, I'm within the amount of uh, the sorry the uh, safe range um, And then this is something I think we should just talk about because we're using anesthetics that we're maybe not comfortable with And this is the idea of local anesthetic uh, toxicity um, So how common is this? Is this something that we need to be worried about? So in a study looking at 300,000 patients in the UK across 400 hospitals, they found uh, with respect to doing regional anesthesia, the uh, episodes of local anesthetic toxicity was 0.18%. And, um, and for people experiencing major episodes, so that would be like a seizure, cardiac arrest, <clears throat> something of, of significance, it was 0.02%. So <clears throat> very uncommon, especially if you're staying within that, uh, the safe range. Um, and again, there's ways that you can uh, minimize risk by doing things like ultrasound guided where you can actually see where your needle's going. Um, I wanted to touch on this briefly as we talk about uh, local anesthetic toxicity. Not that this is the, um, the center pillar of my talk, but uh, the ASRA, so ASRA, uh, which is the Society of Regional Anesthesia, came out with some uh, practice advisories statement on local anesthetic toxicity a couple years ago. And I just busy slide, but if we just look at the top part, um, what they say is that you have this kind of classic description of uh, anesthetic toxicity as being initially some CNS excitations. So you get things like metallic taste or tinnitus, and then that's followed by seizures and CNS depression, where you get coma, respiratory uh, depression, and then you finally end up with your cardiac toxicity which would initially present as uh, dysrhythmias and then eventually cardiac failure, um, hypotension, uh, decreased contractility, asystole, et cetera. Um, they challenge that uh, kind of classic uh, description. So this, this concept, this comes out of Gold Franks, um, that you move from <clears throat> kind of the numbness of the tongue all the way up to cardiac arrest in that sort of sequential order. Um, they say that that's uh, probably not, that's, that probably represents a minority of cases um, and instead, uh, again, busy slide. But if you just look at the bottom right, um, in a one-third, one-third, one-third distribution, you can see some patients will present with CNS symptoms only, some will present with cardiovascular symptoms only, and some with, with both. And so you just want to sort of be aware of some of the symptoms that can um, result from a local anesthetic and be aware of them as opposed to always just thinking about if they don't have, you know, numbness of the, or like metallic taste, then they're fine. Um, because if you start seeing a lot of you know, PVCs and, and changes on your ECG, then you might want to think about, is this going on? <clears throat> um, and then finally, 
if you give somebody anesthetic, if you have symptoms immediately, so within a minute, that, that suggests you've had an intravascular uh, injection, whereas um, if, it's, uh, if it's not intravascular, the symptoms can be delayed. Their recommendation is uh, that you monitor these patients after doing a regional anesthetic for about 15 to uh, 30, or sorry, 30 minutes, um, and that would be reasonable to cover almost all patients that are, if they're going to experience uh, a complication would experience it within that time frame. So whenever I do a procedure, I'll put them on cardiac monitoring for about 30 minutes, at which point um, I'm comfortable to take them off. Again, the slide is just showing that most complications are occurring uh, within the first 30 minutes. Um, so that is the list. Um, I'll go into a couple more slides, but I hope I was able to address some of those points and maybe change some of your minds in terms of um, some, some of the blocks that are in place as to, uh, pardon the pun, as to why we are not performing uh, these, uh, this regional anesthetic technique. Um, so in terms of ultrasound guided, I've made several allusions to using this uh, technique, but I haven't actually shown you how to do that. Unfortunately, when I designed this um, talk, I was going to be doing a, a live demonstration and, and have some people from the audience come down to try it. And obviously with COVID, we can't do that, but uh, I was lucky enough to have um, Frank and uh, Shane help me out with filming something, so I'll show you that momentarily. Um, but in terms of the terminology, I'll just briefly touch on this. Some of you may have heard of something called a femoral nerve block, for, and some have heard of a fascia iliaca block or a three-in-one block. Um, for the simplicity's sake, a femoral nerve block is where you uh, take your needle, you place it directly around the femoral nerve with the goal of injecting local right around that nerve. I'll show you a very quick um, clip. So it's hard to see, but the nerve is right here. The needle tip is right there, and you can see that this black fluid is now surrounding the femoral nerve. Um, it's a great block. This requires a little bit more skill. You'd have to be able to see your needle at all times. And of course, you're uh, introducing a little bit of a, a risk of damaging the nerve as your needle has to get quite close. Um, so this is, not, this is not one that I, um, recommend, especially if it's if you're new to this. Instead, um, I push towards the fascia iliaca block, which you don't target a specific nerve. In fact, you try to move pretty far away from any of the major structures, and you use a high, um, a high volume block. So you take, let's say the rapivacaine that I showed you, you take all 10 mils of that, and you'd add 30 cc's of saline to get 40 cc's total. Um, and then you would inject that uh, into, um, into a fascial plane, and then that will eventually kind of diffuse out and bathe uh, various nerves, including the femoral nerve, the uh, obturator, and the uh, lateral femoral cutaneous. <clears throat> so you can see here the gray at the anterior part of the thigh um, is the femoral nerve distribution. You have your obturator, which is more medial, and then your lateral femoral cutaneous. And so this red uh, distribution is the area that you're going to be providing the anesthetic to by doing um, a three-in-one block, which is where the patient will be having Pain. So <clears throat> I'm going to walk you through uh, Shane doing a uh, fascia iliaca block here with Frank, our wonderful assistant. So just to start, so in terms of the um, location of the probe and the needle, you're essentially holding the probe where you would if you were doing a central line, so of either a femoral art line or a femoral um, uh, central line. Um, and when you hold the probe here, so what you'll see, let me show you that, I'll show you in a second. So is this, so um, again, we have from lateral is screen right, medial is screen left. And if you use your navel approach, you have nerve, which is this kind of whitish structure um, being lateral, then you have your artery and then your vein, which I'll highlight in blue, red, and yellow. Um, and now what I want you to do is look at screen bottom right. You're gonna see his probe slide laterally, so away from these structures. And as he does that, you're gonna see the structures on the ultrasound screen move completely off screen. So he'll slide here. And now you can see you're staring at two muscle bellies. So the first is the iliacus muscle and the sartorius. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, so, let me just get to that spot again. So it's not actually important that you know what the muscle is. It's, the most important thing is <clears throat> that you can identify the fascial layer that I'll show you in just a second. And then, um, oh my God, sorry. <clears throat> I clearly have problems. Um, let's see, so. There we go. So, um, 
over top of the iliacus muscle is your fascia iliaca uh, and above is the fascia lata. So this is the fascia lata up top and the fascia iliaca down below. Um, so what you'll see is Shane will take his needle, he'll insert it in plane with the probe. So you'll be able to see the needle on the screen very easily in just a second. Um, so you can start to see it coming in here. It'll be a little bit more obvious in a second. But he's now poked through this top fascia layer, and he's about to poke through the second layer right now. So that's your second pop. And this is where you're injecting the local anesthetic, and you're trying to get it, you can see here now a pocket, and you're spreading that. And eventually, if you, we didn't put 40 cc's in, but if you put a lot in, you would see that really spread across the muscle. And again, if you're having a lot of resistance, your needle just might be a little bit too far. If you look at the yellow, you're going to see uh, he withdrew the needle a little bit too much at one point, and now he's injecting local above this fascial plane. So then he just pops right back through, starts injecting, and you can see the uh, the anesthetic going below the fascia iliaca. So you can do it by ultrasound. You can do it as a combination of ultrasound and feel. Um, but I think the important thing to show here is that you're really not anywhere close to the nerve, the artery, the vein. There's not a lot of damage that you can do here. Um, yeah. Uh, and then finally, so, um, you know, is there an advantage to one over the other? Should we be doing it ultrasound guided? Is it fine to do it as loss of resistance? Um, I think the takeaway is both are very good. If you look at um, the way they did this study was they took ice, they did an injection of uh, lidocaine, and then they um, tested to see if the patient could feel the ice or not, and that's how they knew if it was effective. And you can see that there's no statistical significant, uh, significance uh, between doing the loss of resistance technique or the ultrasound with respect to um, getting a good anesthetic of the anterior and the lateral distribution. If you want to have complete anesthesia, so that would be including your obturator, so you know lateral, medial, and in, sort of and anterior, there is a little bit of a difference with ultrasound. Um, so in this case they went from about 47% to 82. So I, I still think though the benefit of um, getting any degree of pain relief uh, if ultrasound scares you or if you don't want to be a slightly more sterile then I, I think the um, loss of resistance technique is totally reasonable. So um, the take home point from this is that ultrasound is probably a little bit better especially if you're going to get complete uh, relief of, um, of pain. Um, however both the ultrasound and landmark technique uh, lead to a, a pretty good reduction of pain following hip fracture. So I bring the slide back. Uh, it's something that you can do. Um, obviously, I don't expect you to go out today in your shift and just perform this. I mean, if you want to, that's fine. But um, you can find a number of us that, that do this procedure uh, not too infrequently, and we'd be happy to walk you through it. Uh, whether that's using a chicken model, we have a, a high fidelity model that we can train you on, and then we can do it in the department. Uh, between uh, myself, Frank, Bazad, Jason Lamb, uh, Shane, um, uh, Roy has done them before. So there's a lot of us that, that have done it um, and we're happy to show you at any point if this is something you feel like it would be good for your practice. So um, that is pretty much the talk. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Brad, I have a question, it's Sean. It um, just very quickly, uh, what would your approach be to the patient that did develop, uh, uh, you know, toxicity of some sort from, uh, um, from one of these nerve blocks? Yeah, so, um, and actually in, in looking at the literature, they don't, I'd be interested to get Morgan's take on this, because um, it's not very clear as to um, when intralipid should make its way in to the algorithm. Um, they, they say when somebody has local anesthetic toxicity, you should use it, but I would think if somebody's having, you know, some metallic taste, um, I would just watch them rather than inject, than give them intralipid. But uh, if somebody was having a significant side effect from their uh, anesthetic and they started having, you know, significant dysrhythmias, um, you know, respiratory depression, it is uh, intralipid that you would give. Uh, there's been a recent change in the dosing, but I, um, I, but I believe it's 1.5 mils per kilo as a bolus, and then you run an infusion. Um, if somebody knows different, feel free to chime in. Um, but that is the most important of the things to do, and then it's going to be supportive care. The other thing with uh, with anesthetic toxicity is you really want to prevent them from becoming acidotic, um, because this will worsen the effect of the, the block. Um, a, a local anesthetic is a weak 
base. And so in an acidic environment, it will take on a hydrogen. And when, when the base becomes uh, protonated, it, it can't leave, it can't diffuse back through the membrane, so it stays within the cell. So um, you want to think about sodium bicarb early if there's any evidence of acidosis. But those would be the two, two things. So supportive care, intralipid, and uh, consideration of sodium bicarb. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's super rare, um, the incidence of any kind of significant uh, local anesthetic toxicity. Um, but again, you want to set yourself up for success. So that would be anytime I do this, I have um, the patient monitored. I've let the nurse know what I've done and I tell them what to look out for specifically from a ECG perspective. So you're looking for, you know, changes in rhythm um, and then as well as some clinical, um, some clinical changes that they would experience. So I think just having a good communication with your nursing staff is another way to prevent anything from progressing to significant uh, local anesthetic toxicity. I wonder if this would actually be something that would be worth having uh, a little, uh, uh, I don't know, some sort of a, a learning aid or something that nurses could easily go to uh, so that there would be a sort of a standard um, list of things that they would be looking out for rather than, you know, repeating it every time we could, we could refer them to a, a, a very short, you know, one page document of some sort. Yeah, that actually, that'd be very good. We could put it on Fred and then just print it out and, and give it to them. Uh, John, uh, Jason, uh, one of the nursing leaders there made an educational module for the nurses that were distributed before. So it is accessible to them in terms of, you know, regional anesthesia and all the stuff that you guys highlighted. Um, it can be resent, uh, but yeah, they, they should have a learn. I don't think it's an I learn specifically, but an educational screencast made by him. That's great. Thank you. The, the one other thing, just if there's, uh, I, I'm having to still take questions. Uh, when you perform this block, there is a very easy online, uh, like on PowerChart, um, order set where you can um, choose to fill it as much or as little as you want. Um, but you say, you use ropivacaine, you use this many mils, um, you can say whether or not there were complications or not. It, it, it's all up to you how much you want to put in there, but it, it puts it onto the system. It means you don't need to write a note about your procedure because you can just kind of click all the things like you discussed, all the risks and, and that sort of thing. And then the other good reason for doing that is um, when anesthesia sees these patients, they can easily see what time you gave it, how much you gave them, so they know when it's safe to, to uh, do another procedure. Um, and I'm happy to... What do you search for? Uh, what do you search I, I believe it's... Um, I was I always have to I kind of guess every time I do it, but it, Frank, you wanna... uh, that Jason Lamb posted it there. Oh, in the uh, in the comment section. Yeah, yeah. But I'm ha I'm happy to show anybody how to how to do it anytime with round shift. Yeah. So excellent rounds, it's Christy. Excellent rounds, Brad, and certainly it generates a lot of interest and will change the way that we provide care to our hip fracture patients potentially. I think a couple of things, John, you bring a good point about having nursing involved in this. I think there's probably an opportunity that we need to be doing that standardized across the site. So I will take that back to our nursing leadership team because I think there will probably be more interest in doing this fascia iliaca block. So I'll, I'll look after that. I guess the a uh, couple of questions. Is there a scholarly opportunity? If a number of us are using this hip fracture block, should we be looking at some scholarly work with it, whether it's uh, identifying complications, the use of narcotics? That would be one comment and we can take that away and think about it. The other thing as we're doing this, I think it's probably important to document a few things um, prior to doing the block, like no quads leg and no foot drop, knowing that they are potential iatrogenic complications of doing an iliaca block or a femoral nerve block. So there may be additional information that we should be providing our physician staff before the usual hip fracture season starts very soon uh, about appropriate documentation. And I know Frank, in your documentation with your clinical notes, there's a lovely procedure note and clinical note that we could um, incorporate into the education for staff as well. Uh, yeah, that's right. And when I've asked um, the orthopods exactly what it is they want documented, I, I guess really the blunt response I got was document what is a ner like your neurological exam. They just want to know beforehand that there were no pre-existing conditions, I think, which is the one of those things that maybe we don't check sometimes. Um, but yeah, that they didn't really request specifically like this comprehensive neurological exam, they just wanted to know what was done prior and what the patient can do. But there is a uh, part of that procedure note Brad highlighted on and as we move to online charity and that should be all 
populated and automated. So that should help smooth the process over as well. Excellent. And the other thing that I am working on and have a meeting next week is reinstituting the hip fracture pathway at UH. So, uh, you know, that, that will help as we move into hip fracture season, I'm hoping. Um, but excellent rounds, Brad and Frank. Uh, excellent work. Thanks. Um, the one other thing I'll add, if, you're, if you are having issues with pulling up that online um, uh, charting system or, or you don't want to do it, uh, something that does help anesthesia would be to, if you take a, a surgical marker and you literally write on the thigh, you write 10 milligrams or you know 100 milligrams of whatever at 1400 hours um, and then they will see that and they'll know um, how much you gave um, i recommend doing it online but if that's if that's not going to happen that's another uh, way that uh, because anesthesia should know if you did this in the emergency yeah and i think brad brings up one thing that i think a lot of staff um also ask is like well i don't know if ortho wants us to do it or you know like and and for the most part we've had um you know good uh, uptake across the city i know certainly at vec they're supportive of it um abdel and uh, uh dave sanders are very proponents of us doing this and um you know they're at uh, uh my understanding uh christy is at least they have no problem with us doing it though obviously it's something to clarify because they are different groups so um, as it is right now, you don't have to specifically check with Ortho and run it by them, but if you want to do it, it's all about the documentation. I've had no barriers and I've had their support in terms of us implementing this. Uh, regional anesthesia is supportive of it as well for these one shots. All they ask is that we document just in case we do it at two in the morning and they have to do something at eight in the morning. They just want to know dosages and things. So uh, they're on board and uh, our, our geriatric colleagues are also supportive of it for a lot of the reasons of the delirium and pain control that we highlighted before. Um, I know uh, Jenny Thane was on the line here. If she still is, I was wondering if she could say a quick little piece or if she has any thoughts or comments towards uh, us using this as well. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm just uh, on here. I'm the geriatric lead of the hip factor pathway over at uh, Victoria Hospital. Um, and coming back to uh, what uh, somebody mentioned about scholarly work, some of this um, local anesthetic and re, uh, re, uh, regional blocks is part of a larger hip fracture trial that we're implementing at Victoria Hospital as part of the hip fracture unit, looking at multi-component um, interventions to improve um, outcomes. And part of that is a geriatric consultation on all patients over the age of 65 with hip fracture. Um, and I would echo a lot of what Brad says about uh, reduction in delirium. We know that, um, you know, patients who don't get enough pain relief are at higher risk of delirium than patients who uh, get adequate or even a little bit uh, more pain relief that they absolutely need. And a lot of our older patients aren't able to um, voice uh, the amount of pain uh, relief that they, that they require. And we know that once you de develop delirium, it increases your length of stay, it reduces your outcomes, it increases your risk of mortality and also uh, institutionalization as well. So we would very much support this and um, we're hoping to see what some of those um, outcomes are going to be at the end of our trial, um, which we did have to uh, stop recruiting um, because of COVID, but I believe that we're back on track for that now. Uh, Julie. Hi, thanks, Brad. Um, I want to thank you for an excellent talk. Um, I had a couple comments. Um, I've done maybe five or so hip blocks since joining LHFC, and I've had some experience um, in Ottawa when they were doing their trial as well. Um, so a couple of comments with regards to logistical, um, uh, to help facilitate them logistically. Um, one is the patient population and consent. So my process is that I, I get informed consent before doing this procedure, which can be challenging in this demographic that often presents with Alzheimer's or dementia. So that has been one um, area that adds to your time or your flow. The second is equipment. Um, even though we have these kits, they are, I would say 80% of the time that I'm looking for them, they're not available. Um, with the supplies that are required. So trying to find them or finding the needles with the actual uh, tubing, um, all the supplies that you need has been a bit of a barrier. Um, but in auto, what made it easier was just a big Tupperware with a list of instructions, um, all of the supplies that are needed in the kit, as well as a recommended dosing and volume of one anesthetic with a marker, a Sharpie and instructions on how to, how to notify. So I document um, 
on my chart what I do, but I also write on the patient's leg the volume, the concentration, the time, and the date. So a big obnoxious thing that ortho can't miss on, on the patient's leg to know that I've done it. But here, not having like an LHSC-wide protocol and um, knowing that the orthopedic surgeons all accept and approve um, eMERGE doing this prior to an orthopedic assessment has been a little bit of a barrier because in my time that I've been here, I have had one or two staff say no. Um, so personally, I do always call and ask uh, before doing the procedure to make sure that I have their permission because I've had the experience of them saying no. Um, so just having an LHS. So who said no? Pardon me? Who said no? Um, it was at Vic. I don't remember the name of the staff. It was the staff orthopedic surgeon or the resident? The resident said that they would check with the staff and the staff wanted the, the resident to assess first. So I didn't do it. Well, um, Dave back to me because I've had support of Dave who, and, uh, who runs the hip fracture unit at Vic and said they would be in full support. So that's, that's a, an anomaly into what I've heard. And I would encourage any staff who get those feedback to feed it back to me because um, uh, I've been working on with Jenny and, and the group on that sort of stuff. It doesn't make sense based off what I heard to hear that. And sometimes the residents are told differently. Uh, and, and Dave Sanders and Abdul are happy to be involved in those good discussions in terms of their uptake. So um, these were obviously supposed to happen back in March in terms of the rounds. So there obviously been a little delay on that. With regard to the kits and blocks, that's been um, a progress as well to institute those and obtain those. Um, unfortunately, HHMS, uh, I think because of everything, just consistently moves things around these days. Um, so while we would have liked to have found a home shortly, I think within the last seven months, it's moved about five times. So until it finds a permanent home, that's a, that's a bit tougher. Um, I know the Ottawa as well was a study which helped then move things along in terms of the teaching. And that was part of what instituted their little kits. Um, and that's something that EDTs and HMS are happy to look into, but supply and demand have to occur, meaning there has to be a bit more of a push and, and ask from us to then necessitate that. And I think part of these rounds are hopefully to move those chains a little bit that we can bring it back to discussion with the leadership to stock those, but um, totally accepting. And uh, trust me, I feel that same pain trying to find the equipment. It's, it's a shitty barrier to have. Yeah, I think once like, it's probably a good QA project, but having those kits with a sheet inside that has all the instructions as well as your consent form and the neurovascular exam that you're supposed to do, check, 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 and can be put on the chart would be helpful. Um, and then just as a side note, the femoral nerve block and the fascia iliaca block are billed differently. The femoral nerve block has its own code. The fascia iliaca block is billed as a major plexus block, a three in one block and is billed about 30 bucks more. Um, and then uh, just to touch on something, uh, thanks for the comments, Julie. Um, Frank and a med student have put together a Western Sano app, which our plan will be you download the app, um, you will then click on hip block. It will tell you, there'll be several options. One will say, what do I need? And it will lay out, if you're going to do this, what exactly do you need to go grab? Um, we'll tie the safe local hopefully into the app itself so you can double check the dosing. Um, and so, and then there'll be a video in there if you want to refresh and, and watch the video that I put together, et cetera. Um, and so hopefully it's like a one-stop shop where you can, because you know you may not do it for a couple of months or something, you can, pull it up, see exactly what you need to grab, how much you need to give, and, and go from there. Um, so that's in the works too. Yeah, so I know, I know we're kind of at the end of rounds here, but I just, uh, I hope at least some of these reduce some of the barriers and thoughts. I know some staff just frankly won't change practice because I know it's a lot easier to just order x-rays and pain meds and walk away. And I know we're busy. I just, I, I personally find patients uh, benefit quite a bit. And I do think about the downstream effects about their length of stay. So um, I think it's a good multi-system uh, approach that we're doing, both in collaboration with anesthesia, ortho, and, and geriatrics, and I think it builds a lot of bridges. So if any staff have any questions, uh, feel free to direct them at me or, or Brad. Um, you know, Shane works on this, Jason's passionate about it, um, and I'm on the hip fracture working group. So whatever I can do to help reduce the barriers, and I'm happy to train staff. It's just, I probably, there's a number of staff I know I've shown how to do this, and even after a couple, four or five of them, they're like, yeah, I, I still need to do another one on your, and I think at some point you just need to take the step and try it on your own because it is a very safe block when you just think of all the number of steps and we do so many more um, 
risky things that seem much more like part of your, your typical practice. So um, something I'll continue to work on, but I, I do encourage people to reach out to me if they have any questions. If you have any complaints, please send them to Brad though, okay? Frank, strike while the iron is hot right now with the suggestions that Julie had. I would say if you, you know, really give a good push now, you've got a better chance of moving things forward. Yeah. Yep. Unfortunately, some factors are beyond my control um, in terms of, you know, things that might escalate, but I, I agree. And that's, I was timing the events of this round to then move the next steps forward. So we'll see how that uh, shakes out. And Feedback is always appreciated for everybody else, but just know that all our allied health um, and all our colleagues above that see these patients are in support of it. All right, I think that's all we got. Great rounds. Thank you. Thanks guys. And thanks for attending from other uh, disciplines.